Welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we are continuing our discussion on Concrete Rose by Angie Thomas. Today, we will be focusing on the second half of the prequel to The Hate You Give, looking at some of our favorite moments. Uh, well, um, so as usual, you know, uh, I'm Jorge Gomez and um, I am your co-host. Uh, Today we're gonna finish um, Angie's novel and talk a little bit about, you know, how it sets up the the world of Garden Heights that we see in The Hate You Give. Uh, So naturally there will be spoilers in this episode, but I hope you all don't mind um, because you've been given the fair warning about it. Yeah, if Uh, not, pause it right now, pause it, save the episode and finish the book. Yes. but uh, I'll let my my uh, friends and co-hosts introduce themselves. And, um, you know, we left off in the um, chapter 16. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, so my name is Vanessa, and I am an undergraduate student at UTEP majoring in literature. Right on. And uh, <laughs> my, my name is Richie, and I help sometimes with the podcast, co-hosting and producing the the audio so we can deliver it to your ears and um yeah i'm always excited to hear what you guys think about the book so let's commence let's jump right in then um you know this is um we had left off with what is the proverbial cliffhanger right because um lisa had broken that pop that news uh to mav you know that she was pregnant and so, you know, that's where uh, he, you know, he goes and takes a paternity test, right? Um, you know, to top it off, right? He already, he's already got seven. And uh, of course, you know, this is a big issue because see, of course, as we had talked about you, I think you mentioned it, Richie, right? That this was an unplanned um, pregnancy, of course, um, you know, based on their previous encounter. Um but, you know, um, I think where we where we were going to go to is chapter 17, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll jump there. And Vanessa, you have our first passage of the day um, on page 201, 202, uh, right? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to talk about this because this is so... Um... Maverick's mom decides that she's obviously not sure how to handle the situation because he just, they, Lisa and Maverick just told her that she's pregnant. Um, And so she decides that she's going to take Maverick out to see his dad. Um, And so on page 202, um, it's really interesting to see the way that both his mom and his dad just pass blame for like, the choices that Maverick is making. Um, yeah. And then um, his dad even goes as far as to blame Mo, which I think is interesting um, because her point is that he's not around and he's saying that she's also not very much around. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I, I do think it's that it's interesting to see that they argue about it rather than sitting with Maverick and seeing what's going on with him. Mm-hmm. They just argue between the two of them instead. Yeah. And, and Maverick himself, right, wonders about that too, you know, and kind of stands up for her, right? Because he's like on two or three, pops his in on Ma, this is my fault, right? Um, mm. So uh, at least there's that, you know? But yeah, you know, it's kind of that prototypical scene of, you know, the, the, where the parents argue in the movie or book, right? And then the kid's right there and mm-hmm. they're talking about the kid, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. When he's right but, there. Uh, yeah. 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 It's a very emotionally intense scene. I mean, he, what he, he left when he was, he said eight, right? It's something like that. Yeah. Where mm-hmm. went to jail, like, uh, I don't know, just left, but right. Um, I mean, you can tell that, I mean, they don't get to see each other that often. And now that this, you know, very 
intense life changing situation is happening to to Maverick. Um, all these all this other stuff that they've probably kind of not really discussed are coming up to the table. And you know, it's just kind of again back to it, like what does it take to to raise a child? And and of course here like emotions get high and it's 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 very easy to to just kind of pu- push the blame off to someone else and you know as maverick says you know or he you know he steps in and gets kind of mad at his father you know hey you weren't even here and you know which isn't good he's defending mm-hmm. his mom and did you have the kind of moment to talk about the whole name thing again in this situation right what did what does your name mean which i think is uh his his father apparently always would always remind him what his his name means and so um obviously this blows up and and maverick just kind of walks out during this but no and and i wanted to ask you guys is that a callback to doug like doesn't mav do that to star Mm. yeah they they do do that yeah 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 Yeah. so It's because, uh, yeah, I mean, you can tell that there's a certain part of Don Adonis's character that um, rubs off. I mean, other than them looking very, very similar, mm-hmm. um, a lot of the way he's described reminds me of Maverick as we see him in The Hate You Give. Mm. Um, and on page 202, you know, you kind of see a little bit of that, the way his, his, his father is kind of asking him to hold, him, hold himself up as a person at the top of the uh, at the top of 202 right he says pops never let me talk to anybody without looking them in the eye and he never let me stumble on my words i better say what i mean no hesitation so it's a very like straightforward like mm. um which may be even confrontational but i feel that comes out of it is like what does your name mean so that whole insistence on not only knowing the importance of a name but also like living up to your name. And then and I think that's of course carried on to Maverick, like to him, that's a, an important thing mm-hmm. as well. So I thought that was all pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there's a whole thing about the name um, there, you know, uh, Mav kind of um, comes up with the excuse that like, you know, he had Dre on his mind. Right. And, his dad kind of just calls him out on it. You know, he says, Dre was in on your mind when you was with that girl. We both yeah. know what was. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I think, um, you know, he um, like you're saying, right? I mean, he ends up, you know, blaming dad and then blaming him, blaming his mom, even. Um, and, uh, you know, a little bit even, you know, on page one, on page, um, what is it here? 197, um, you know, in terms of the prison, it's Evergreen Prison. And we're told it's in a small town. And, um, you know, we, I like how Angie kind of talks a little bit about the carceral pro- politics. You know, we talked about the issues of like family separation and, um, you know, how the system kind of traps them, right? Um and the way it's described, you know, it says, uh, Mav says, don't help that if you're like we driving up to a plantation. The prison is surrounded by miles of fields. Sometimes mm. they have the inmates out working in them. When I was a kid, I thought the prison was like a castle. Um, you know, so you, you really get that, those vestiges, right, of like the, you know, the, the system of slavery, right, that was uh, so wicked mm. in that still remains to this day in, in, in that kind of prison system that we have in the US, right? Where we have so many people are incarcerated and working those fields mm. and um, you know, menial labor that they barely get paid pennies for. Um, right, yeah. So I, I thought that was a nice little scene, yeah. setting the scene, right, by Angie. Yeah, that great point. And um... I mean, I mean, on top of that, think about that joke that uh, Don, Don, and and uh, Ma Ma mm. crack with each other on a two hundred one, right? Massa moving to the big house, mm-hmm. kind of um, joking 
joking yeah. around about that um you know using the kind of like the slavery terms but also like the big house right. meaning like of course the the slammer and and all that and right but him moving mm-hmm. up has a and of course um you know you have the commentary of i get why but this not cool you know maverick's thoughts mm-hmm. yeah um and then you know he at least like he kind of takes pride right in that he's like he mentions he's the newest prep cook um that reminds me about, by the way, I, you know, it, it, it sounds silly, but a great kind of look at prison and reform is um, uh, Paddington 2, because uh, he actually goes to prison and he, he ends up transforming prison into like this, you know, jovial environment because of the fact that he starts cooking there. Um, so it just kind of reminded me of that. But Huh, not familiar yeah it, it, it's it's silly but uh, wait are you talking about paddington the bear yeah paddington the bear <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah yeah okay <laughs> so i haven't seen it but i'll have to check no? it out yeah yeah it's you know it's pretty you know like uh good good spirited you know yeah um, interesting and interesting he goes to prison and yeah it's a long story but <laughs> okay yeah. Yeah. put that on the on the back burner for now <laughs> yeah it's, um so after that vanessa what did you have um did you go into the next did you have something in the next chapter um i think you know so right after that right uh lisa comes in right and mentions that she got kicked out because she's pregnant mm. so there's that and then, well, so in the next chapter, it's Thanksgiving um, in chapter 18, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and King shows up to Maverick's house with Aisha. And so that kind of like starts a whole nother situation because oh Maverick hasn't seen Aisha in a good while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we're told right on 219, um, Aisha can't look at either of us. Um, and, um, you know, they, they get into the whole custody thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, once again, I like how, how his mom has his back here and, mm. um, again, no nonsense, uh, you know, pretty much i also i mean i also like that she's very understanding she acknowledges that aisha the postpartum like we talked we briefly mentioned it previous episode Mm -hmm. um but you know she acknowledges it like she she sympathizes with her like it's not easy but you know hey we still need to do this so and i'm glad you know she she has mavs back like even even like that's one of my favorite scenes is when um she's just there with like two plates get grabbing all this food and she kind of you know indirectly no pretty much directly scolds her like you're gonna go feed the baby mav get yourself mm-hmm. a plate yeah and you know they mentioned that it's custody also but it's also about like being able to get benefits you know so like wick and food stamps mm-hmm. uh so it brings up the whole like sociopolitics of you know why those kinds of things matter you know um and then um, I think this already happened, but, you know, um, Lisa had talked about with Mav and, you know, she talks about it later on also about her pregnancy. Right. And so, you know, she talks about whether she's going to go through with it. Right. Or whether she's going to actually have an abortion. And so they do kind of bring that up and, um, you know, Mav is kind of, um open about it at least open-minded but i think you know he wants of course not of course but he wants Mm -hmm. her to have the baby you know because because you know he likes lisa right so but um but i said what else did you have in the early 200s um um well and then my next one is until like 239 okay um, so in this chapter, Carlos, Lisa, and Maverick go to the first um, doctor's appointment. Um, and at the end of the appointment, Maverick is trying to pay. And 
later in the book, we see that he starts um, dealing drugs again um, because he sees that he's he does need more money than what he's getting from Mr. Wyatt. Um, but here in this in this scene, he the he's trying to pay the copay, and it's twenty dollars, but he doesn't have any money left um, because he he paid for like the bills and he got toys for seven. Mm-hmm. Um, I do. I'm curious as to why he bought toys. Like I understand that it's a baby, but if he has another baby coming buying toys just doesn't seem like a priority to me mm-hmm. so i do think that that's interesting as well mm-hmm. for sure um and then more of like what you're saying right about how difficult it is to to raise it for him to you know be raising this baby and mm-hmm. and then of course the, the new baby that's coming um based on on mr wyatt's salary right that he gives him um mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, like he realizes there, you know, he says, right, I got to get back in the drug game. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's obviously so just, just a shortcut, right? Because he's not thinking about, well, you know, I can get my degree or I can go to college, right? Mm-hmm. Um, get a better job, right? Right. Um, but it's just funny. Yeah, like you're saying, like he's not really budgeting well. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean... <laughs> But I mean, that shows the, the kind of stress people are under. And and, and mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, the reality is people aren't good with their money. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially like this is him realizing, damn, I shouldn't have done that. You know, like there's no way I can afford all this, especially with now another kid. So mm-hmm. to him, his only option, that that's the thing. It's like desperation. You know, mm-hmm. he's kind of that's in his in his mind now. The only way, the easy way is is to get back into the drug game yeah and um you know he chooses to kind of go against three's wishes right and he recognizes that mm-hmm. um and so that takes us to part three which is dormancy um so this is uh chapter 20 and um i don't know if anyone had something earlier but i had here 247 of this opening chapter of this section um so um it's just it's another paragraph where uh angie kind of waxes sociopolitical about you know um the drug business and um you know i think um it's an important and accurate way i think of describing it you know because of course there's a stereotype that you know, it kind of just stays within that community, right? But it says, mm-hmm. uh, forget what you heard. Drug addicts still only live in the hood. I mostly sell to people who ain't in the garden, white college students who pull up because they want to try something new. Businessmen from downtown who want a wild weekend. These rich kids at St. Mary's who will spend their entire allowance to get high. Um, and he goes on. Um, so, you know, I'm just picturing... Um, what was Star's boyfriend's name again? Was it sort of a C or Chris? Chris? Yes. Yeah, I'm just picturing Chris here uh, as one of his customers, um, <laughs> you know, who can get away with it. And uh, if anyone's seen the film Traffic, you know, I think Traffic does a good job of trying to capture that by Steven Soderbergh, you know, how drugs, these, you know, um, hard drugs, right, like Coke and that are are end up being sold to white communities but that are not policed in the same way as you know african-american communities are uh and so there's that big you know discrepancy um and i like how angie kind of you know uh does it like actually manages to describe it you know and um it, you know, it, it's interesting as well because Star, does she go to St. Mary's or whatever the name of the school was? No, um, she goes to, um, oh my gosh. Oh, right, because it's not a Catholic school, right? It's just like a... No, it's, it's, okay. it, I think it's just a private school. Right. Yeah. Um, I can't think of the name of it right now. <laughs> but, it, but it's definitely not St. Mary's? No, no. It's, no. um, 
I'm getting the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, and, you know, so, so that's where he, I'm, he brings this up because that's where he kind of thinks, well, you know, this is where I got my shot, right? Like I can get people to buy for me in these, you know, in these areas, the white neighborhoods. Um, and, um, you know, so that's what he's thinking, right? He's, um, mm -hmm. again, going back to the passage that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so at the end of the page, towards the bottom of the page, um, he starts talking about how, how it is so different for like, just because of like the, where they're from. Mm -hmm. um, he says, it kind of peeved me how life set up. Here I am trying to make money to keep my mama's lights on. Meanwhile, some rich brat might hit me up tomorrow offering to spend a couple of hundred for an experience. He never think what that money mean to somebody like me. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there about um, the um, class distinctions, right? Um, people who can have the privilege of just being able to avoid any kind of policing of their actions, right? Whereas someone like Mav, you know, has to be looking over his shoulder. Um, and, um, you know, we of course see this reified in The Hate You Give, right, with Khalil. Mm -hmm. um, whom, you know, for those who are wondering, yes, Khalil does make a cameo here, actually. Um, I think it's right here a little later, right, 253. Um, and we were talking about this pre-show, guys, right? So I don't know if you, if you had this passage, Vanessa, but what's the interesting thing about Khalil's dad that we find out here? Oh, um, so one of the characters that we mentioned earlier, um, Red, mm -hmm. we find out that his name is actually Jerome and he is Khalil's dad. Yeah. And so Red, you know, um, we briefly mentioned it, right? But he's the one who gave him this bad pair of sneakers and the um, Jordans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fake airs. Um, and, uh, you know, King kind of stood up for him at first, but then King being King, like a snake, you know, he kind of just does it to actually turn against um, Mav. So he actually ends up siding with Red, as weird as that might be, you know, but that's King. Because um, King is going to do whatever best helps him. Um, but anyway, so that's Red, right? And so um, Red is not just and you know, being Khalil's father here, um, at the end of this chapter on 258, you know, he's lifting Khalil, Red is, and uh, he, um, Mav notices that it's Ray's watch that he's wearing. And he says, the one that was stolen in the night, he was killed. Um, so after this, you know, there's nothing else on, I, it seems there's nothing else on um, Mav's mind, right? But Red being Dre's killer because he thought it was Ant, right? But, you know, now he, that he sees it could be Red, um, that's all he can think about. So um, I didn't have a passage until 270. I don't know if you had something before that, Vanessa, with mm -hmm. Mr. Wyatt or... Um, um, on 268? Yeah. Um, so after he sees Dre's watch and he realizes that he might have been wrong in who killed Dre. Mm -hmm. um, he sees some of the other members of the King Lords, um, Peanut, and I don't know who else. I don't think he names the rest of them. Um, mm -hmm. But I, since Sean got arrested um, and Dre was killed, Peanut is kind of trying to move up in the gang. Um, and here Maverick is asking Peanut, like, what should we do? Like, I, like, asking for his help and for his advice. Mm -hmm. And Peanut kind of just laughs at him. And at the end of the chapter, he says, for the first time in my whole life, I ain't sure I can depend on the set. It looked like Dre can't neither. Um, and it's just really interesting to see because, like, from what people assume of gangs, I think, 
is that it's like a family kind of thing mm-hmm. and everyone's there to protect one another to be there for one another to like support one another but here he's he's seeing that they're not there for him and they don't really care mm-hmm. yeah um you know and, and what i was wondering vanessa and i don't know what you guys think is um you know when i first read this i thought that peanut was kind of in on it you know Hmm. um that maybe they conspired against together you know him and red um but um but no i mean the other thing that i found interesting there was like peanut just kind of says you're lucky i respect race wishes for you to stay out of the drug game or else i'd make you put into work right um earning your stripes as, as they say right mm-hmm. hmm. Hmm. Well, that is the part of the the gang thing, right? Because it is it is quote unquote family. As long as you're doing the work for the family, mm. um, and and pretty much the only thing kind of keeping him out of trouble from with these guys is just promises from like at initially, you know, his connection to Don being the former leader, to of course, you know, Dre and Sean, also, um, but. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I I had never really considered the whole peanut thing, and he's pretty dismissive of Red too. You know, he mm-hmm. calls him a, a right. weakling, and uh, right. I don't know, and you know, mm-hmm. in, in their minds, um, Maverick isn't worth anything because he's not doing work for the for the gang, right? Mm. So to him, he's just like, this isn't, you know, this isn't worth my time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, which is funny, you know, because. Um, I think there's a point where um, he calls his baby little peanut, you know, and then you have this dude whose name is peanut and, you know, just, I don't know, just a, unlike ant, you know, with peanut, like the name, I don't know. Um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> thinking like little, like little man syndrome kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we see that, like, it, it kind of reminds me of ant a little bit where you have these guys who have to, put up a big game mm-hmm. uh, to maybe cover up insecurities. And so they act a certain way. Um, right. You see, you know, you actually do see this from peanut earlier. Like I, I always think uh, it's funny how he tries to like use vocabulary. That he doesn't like that's above, <laughs> so he, he's kind of like inventing new words. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and that's a little bit based probably on him trying to put up a, a, a bigger front, you know, or he's mm-hmm. insecure about mm. some things. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, the next chapter 22, right, right at the beginning of it, you know, he's still thinking about red, right? We repeat here the word, you know, red, red, red. It's the same thing, you know, I'm sitting in the front office with red on my mind, right? Um, and the office he's sitting in is uh, Mr. Clayton. So he's the counselor. Um, and, uh, I thought he was an interesting character, you know, we've had um, in this series, this show, you know, we've had talked about different counselors and other books, you know, like uh, Ben Science's collection um, in that last story, I forget what it's called, but um, I like the description here of his office, you know, reminds me of, um, seems like it's just like what Mav ends up, you know, getting as his own, you know, but it says his office kind of dope. He got framed black and white pictures on the walls of all these important black people. I only recognized Malcolm X and Huey Newton, the founder of the Black Panthers. Pops put me on, onto them. I never heard them mentioned in a history class. So there's a lot there. Um, you know, first is kind of how it tells us, of course, Mr. Clayton is, you know, truly not someone like Invisible Man, right? Where he's duplicitous. Mm. He actually does care, right? He's no Bledsoe. Um, and the second thing is kind of uh, reminds me of, uh, I know people are talking about that Judas and the Black Messiah. I haven't seen it yet. But, um, you know, if any of you out there have, you know, um, I hear it's really good and looking at the Black Panthers also um, with, um, what's his name? Um, forget the other Black Panther. Um but anyway, so 
and then also the idea of course like they're not mentioned in history class right and you know not many people know that the black panthers did so much for the com their communities you know with like um food services Wake. and all kinds of things yeah what yeah um so you know i like how in this scene uh mr carter does kind of push him to actually do something right you know get credits uh get a ged right so just like inception right sometimes all it takes is for you to plant that idea in them um because he mentions you know he's not going to be able to graduate um otherwise but you know he's so kind of at the end um ambivalent about it you know because he's just thinking about how to make money right how to work jobs to be able to pay and help his mom but he goes and sees king after that you know so kind of tells you where his mind is you know did you have a passage there vanessa or until the 280s or 270s um well i had um 285. Hmm. yeah um so here um maverick's mom is telling him that she has a date on valentine's day mm -hmm. um and she tells him that it's actually mo um and they just have a conversation about um her relationship with his father and um kind of well not hmm. and how she is bisexual and how her how um Maverick's dad has known this entire time um yeah because um wasn't he he was blaming Mo right um earlier mm -hmm. yes yeah um yeah I don't know what you guys thought about that you know we're told that uh on 286 um there's some kind of, um, you know, that exposition, right, of the flashback of like, you know, Ma was always happier after she had been with Mo. Her face light up when that woman come around. At Dre's repast, Mo helped Ma's have whenever they were close and I thought it was just for support. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely um, an interesting little twist. Um, and um I think it's it's interesting also how Ma kind of is real with Mav, right? Like she doesn't try to mm -hmm. sweep it under the rug. You know, I, I honestly wasn't even surprised. I didn't see it as a twist. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know why, but early on, like the way Mo was brought up, it mm -hmm. did made it make it seem like, you know, it was definitely more to the relationship than I guess the surface mm -hmm. level. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that was that was just kind of more just like intuition. And so um, getting con getting it confirmed here is like, OK, yeah. And and ultimately, Maverick sees that she's been good with her. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I, I feel like it's good for her mom to finally admit it like she feels right. Right. Mm -hmm. She's been a long time. Yeah. And I do like how she kind of mentions that, you know, she says, you know, Adonis made choices that put his life at a standstill. He didn't have to sell drugs. He chose to. I shouldn't have to put my life on hold because of his decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. so I like how she kind of has her the right mindset to think about, you know, in terms of what it, what's going to happen with her if Adonis ever gets out, right? And um, um you know that yeah you know like even though they were together right that she still has she she should still live her life obviously so i think um mm. uh, um yeah i mean it definitely makes makes you happy for for her mom his mom i mean mm -hmm. especially because well towards the bottom of the page she apologizes to him and he's he tells her like well, you don't have to apologize and he, his only concern at this point is like her happiness. Right. Um, and yeah, Richard, you were right, you know, that right there on 287, he says he was eight, you know, almost a decade ago, he says, when they took his father away. Um, and he's kind of, you know, 
reminiscing, right? He's saying, I'm almost grown with two kids. Um, but, um, you know, his father comes back a little later, so we can come back to him. My next passage wasn't until 318. Okay. Did you have something before that? No. Um, Lisa visits like a school, right? Like, because she's mm -hmm. the one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He yes. Takes, that's what he decides to do for Valentine's Day mm -hmm. with her. Okay. Yeah. So they go to Markham State and uh, it's identified as an HBCU, historically back college and university. Um, and so um, it's good, you know, that like he's real supportive of her, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so she's thinking about it for, you know, that maybe for nursing. Um, but yeah, um, so after that, on, um, you know, I think they're still kind of on, he's kind of still on thin ice with her, you know, because, um, she, of course, wasn't planning on having the baby, right? And so that obviously does complicate things. And then what also does complicate it is that she finds out there on 306 that he's still selling, right, with King. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where she kind of draws the line, which I think is good of her to do so, you know, but it also shows how a lot of couples too, of course, end up separating right because of things like that um where you know in this case this is kind of his lowest point i would say you know because he loses lisa and uh he loses you know being a student right he drops out practically um mm -hmm. you know having flunked and um you know he's got two kids um so a little later here on um, 218, he goes back and see, decides to go see his father again. Um, and, um, you know, that's where he brings up Red. Um, and, you know, he tells him here, um, Pop says, do you want to take this business on? You know, the code Pops, right? They're referencing, of course, what you talked about in part one. And his dad says, that's not what I asked you. All I got to do is remember Dre slumped over his steering wheel to know what I want. I can't let nobody get away with it. Then why you come all this way to tell me? You don't need my approval or my permission. Um, I won't give you the permission or approval you want, Maverick. You're becoming your own man. This is your choice to make. You just make sure it's one you can live with. Um, and then at the end, you know, um, at the page... 319, you know, we're told another loud buzz go off. This one signaling that visiting time is over. Inmates and their families stand and say their goodbyes around the room. I only rise when pops do. This time he don't hesitate to wrap me up in his arms. His hugs got power. Nothing else exists beyond them. You know, this scene, of course, also reminds me of what we left off last time, which was uh, Mr. Wyatt, right, giving him that hug. Um, so it's a nice tender moment, but it's also a stern moment, right? Because, you know, he tells Mav, you know, you don't, why are you coming to me, right? You know, why do you need my blessing? Um, and I think he did kind of want that, right? Because he obviously looks up to him, right? Even though he's in prison and um, it's good that, you know, his father here is doing a good job as a role model in the sense that he's not condoning this right he's making forcing him to make that choice himself right he's given that, that free agency mm -hmm. um and you know what ends up happening is that well in the mind of mav he's he's ready to kill red right so he you know he's got he's got a gun, um, and from the three twenties, Vanessa, did you have a passage? I had one till three twenty eight. I had three twenty four. 
which I think goes back to something that you were talking about a little earlier. Yeah. Um, so he talks about a code. Mm -hmm. um, and here he's talking about like, like if there was a book, uh, he says, um, the most important section would be on family. And the first rule would be when somebody kills your family, you kill them. Um, and so this is what he's thinking about when he's on his way to go kill Red. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it ends with him hesitating and ultimately not shooting him. Mm -hmm. Um, he says, I just got to do it. I just got to finally be my father's son. And I think that line about being his father's son is probably what stops him. Mm -hmm. Um, cause later he says, I just got a squeeze, mm -hmm. but he, he doesn't do it. And I think it's because he well he is thinking about seven and lisa and his and their new baby um so like he forget he forgets about all of like the anger that he feels there and mm -hmm. about that rule because he has something else to look forward to i think yeah um and i think also you know um the, the, the what his father left him with right is that kind of he didn't exactly say you know go do it right and I think he would have pulled the trigger if his father would have mm. kind of made him you know stick to that rule of theirs right um so sure it's something yeah. you can live with yeah yeah I actually highlighted the the street rules part too because you I mean that's like the very beginning of the book because mm -hmm. he's he's talking about that as well <laughs> um yeah. it's one of those instances where he actually does the exact same thing where it's like if there were a book and he puts it in bold uh and it's a huge difference mm -hmm. from don't get your ass beat in front of the of a fine girl especially if she your girl right referencing the, the very 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 beginning scene where when they're playing basketball mm -hmm. um yeah but i mean you see a lot of development here where he deviates from what he considers the street rules the book mm. yeah and um you know i he's you know he says on chapter 28 the one sentence chapter the only one sentence chapter that we have i think uh even kidders can get their prayers answered um so so he doesn't pull the trigger and, you know, in chapter 29, he talks to Lisa about it. And I had this, I don't know if you all had it too, but 328, 329. Mm -mm. No. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, he explains it to her. Um, uh, he says, I thought of my kids, my mama and you, what it would do to you all if I got, caught or killed tears slip out of him of it out of his eyes you know and um lisa says no you sound like a man to me and then he says how that fool murdered dre lisa and what i do i let him run away what kind of justice is that and then she says it wouldn't have been justice if you threw your life away to kill him and then you know um at the bottom um you know, he says, my life ain't worth much. I just didn't want to put my babies through that. I know what it's like not to have a father around. So you're saying your fathers deserve to have you? Straight up, they deserve better. And Anissa says, you know, I still believe in you, Maverick. I, we need you to believe in yourself. You do? I do. It tripped me out that she can see that after almost what I did tonight. It's like Lisa sees this version of me that nobody else do. This Maverick who ain't worried about the sit or the streets and who do something worthwhile with his life. I want to be that dude, not the one sitting in a prison telling my kids that I got regrets, you know, referencing their, uh, his own father, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. I like how this scene kind of shows that evolution in, in his character, right? That build on Sraman and um, mm -hmm. his epiphany, right? That um, all it takes is for one person to believe in you and to see the best version of yourself. Um, for you not to pull that trigger and see that as a good decision, right? Because he still kind of 
thinking about it, right? He was still kind of in his mind, I'm a failure, right? I, I chickened out, you know? Um, <clears throat> so it's good that Lisa kind of shows him, you know, the right way to think about that kind of thing. Um, and, um, you know, for him, it's this moment to where he, to me, he kind of becomes a man here, right? Because, you know, he, he has cleansed himself of the sins of his own father, you know, and uh, Big Mav, and um, I mean, Big Don, and um, he is able to kind of transcend that at this, you know, in this scene. Yeah, I mean, that's, I I was reading these this passage right now, and, and it's, it says a lot about the change in, in Lisa and Maverick's relationship, because when he finally admits that you know, he didn't want to do this because he was thinking of them. I think it communicates a lot to Lisa that he isn't being selfish now. And it's kind of re, you know, solidified by, I think, the, the following page where, you know, Maverick is reflecting on how Dre was talking about seeing his daughter for the first time. This is when he finds out that it's it's going to be a girl, too. Mm -hmm. And... um you know, Maverick admits that um, he gets it now. You know, he wants to be a father that she deserved. Yeah, and, um, you know, it kind of does set up this confrontation with uh, with King later on. Because um, um, he ends up flushing the drugs that King, that he was supposed to sell from King. Um and um or rather like i guess mm -hmm. right yeah mm -hmm. yeah because i guess he's trying to hide it from his mom or yeah so he hides it in the bathroom mm -hmm. but he's take he's taking it out of like his hiding spot so that he can give them back to king because he doesn't want to mm. he doesn't want to be selling anymore right um and in taking out the stash he accidentally drops it mm -hmm. into the toilet yeah Mm -hmm. um so did you have a, a passage in this area vanessa like in the 330s i had 338 okay i had um 337 okay um so yeah i mean just setting up yours you know that confrontation with king right um so king when he finds out you know he points again at him right and so you know this shouldn't be surprising to us who already knew king but if this is your first book with him, you know, you, you, I think it's a natural progression, right? That King is not someone to let down because of what he can do to you, right? Um, and uh, he also kind of, you know, mocks him for not kidding Red, right? He says, I bet Red that did kill Dre. He was probably too scared to shoot him. Right. And um, mm -hmm. so, you know, he says, um, you know, here at the bottom, right, as they're having this kind of stare down. Um, and he finally puts a gun down, but he says, if I'm honest with myself, me and King Dunn had a crack between us for a while, ever since the DNA test proved seven, not his. That crack feel like a canyon now. Right, so just I like how um, Mav just kind of recognizes right how far apart they have mm -hmm. grown since that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean he acknowledges that he he lost he, he realizes that he's lost them as a brother, like, and he equates it to losing Dre, right? Because mm -hmm. right after that, I think I'm losing another brother, and this hurt just as bad as putting one in the ground. Yeah, yeah, I mean definitely a, a kind of symbolic separation there um and in vanessa, vanessa you had the the page right after that ends the chapter yeah um so at the top of page 338 um well on 337 maverick tells king that he'll pay him back all of the money um but king tells him no and then on 338 he says you'll pay me back another way one day um and so i connected this moment to the hate you give because we find in the hate you give, we find out that Maverick does go to prison and he's there with his dad. Um, and that was his way of getting out of 
the king lords mm. um you don't you don't see him go to prison in the in the book though in either of them mm. so i think that that's really interesting um yeah. but you do know that he does go to prison take a fall to yeah he takes the fall for king right yeah that that is really interesting um and so you know with king of course it, it is kind of interesting how he does in a sense you know pay back that debt but i was also thinking of like with paying that back um you know with king going after star you know that just like he kind of gave up seven right but still kind of held it against it right that he renamed him seven um is that he's he afterward is going to see star you know as his way of getting between him and lisa just like he got in between him and aisha um is maybe another way of thinking about that line mm. you know but that, that is i think the last we see of king here anyway um and so afterward you know uh he he gets with mr wyatt and um i think um i had 345 but i don't know if you had something before that vanessa no i didn't um, so just kind of saving up his character here. Um, I like that, um, you know, um, uh, let me see. Actually, I think, you know, Mr. White talks into him about how important it is for him to get that GED because he's going to offer him a full-time job, you know, so that's the good news. Mm. Um, and then on... 344, 345. Um, uh, so he's talking to his dad on the phone, right? And uh, he says, um, there's a lot of grown men in the game who don't want to be in it. His dad says, they don't have to get to admit it like you do. They too caught up or too scared of what people will think. They end up accepting that they stuck. For a second, it sounded like he described himself. For you admit that you want out, it means you're thinking for yourself like a man should. They are to start calling you Big Mav instead of Little Don. Um, yeah. You know, so we get this nice retroactive, you know, I, well, it's not even retconning, right? It's just kind of setting up that world of why he's called Big Mav, right? Instead of Little Don. Which is nice, you know, I like that explanation, right? That it comes from the one who can be stole the title. Um, and, um, you know, he signs, he ends up signing up for um, the GED based on Mr. Clayton's information, GED classes. Uh, and then he also takes up a, a landscaping class, right? For the garden for Mr. Wyatt. So I like that too, um, mm -hmm. but um it, it, it's funny how uh, Mr. White at the end there on 347 says, if I'm honest, I'm surprised you lasted this long at, at the job. I thought you've had your dirt strike by now. So that's it for me as far as passages, you know, and it ends here, it leaves us with the epilogue. Mm. Oh, I just wanted to mention about like the gardens. Oh yeah. Um, and like how he gets, he focuses on um, landscaping. Mm -hmm. um in the movie you see him working a lot on the garden mm. like but in, it's never mentioned that he i don't think it's ever mentioned in the book mm -mm. that i can remember so i think that that's a little nice tie-in mm -hmm. to the movie yeah and it's also the moment where you know um he gives a lecture to star and um uh and, and, and seven, right, about um, why it is, uh, I forget what it is, right, but like they do something that they were supposed to, and so they're like in the front front lawn. Um, so there's some nice symbolism there too that it sets up. <laughs> what did you have in the epilogue? Um, the last two pages, 359 and 360. Yeah. Oh, um, so here they're, um, Maverick and Lisa are talking about 
um, names for the baby girl. And um, he tells her about why he was named Maverick. And then he's like, well, who do we want her to be? Right. Um, and then she says, intelligent, independent, outspoken. I doubt there's a name that means all of that. Um, and then they go on to say how she's been one of the few good things um, during all of like the experiences they faced in these mm-hmm. past months. Um, and then the last words on 360, he says, um, a light in the darkness. And then he says, I think I got a name. Yeah, right. Um, and then, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. No, just that, you know, I like how they don't even need to say it, right? We already know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if you're a fan of the book of and of Angie's work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so this so star is born there metaphorically um her name is and um yeah i mean i like that symbolism there right of um he says i look up at the night sky it's pitch black and yet that somehow makes stars shine brighter hundreds of lights in all that darkness and like he said you know that light in the darkness um Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, I really like that ending. You know, I think um, I think it works better to have them be with Star pregnant as opposed to having Star being born and go into that, you know, because I think that would have overlapped too much with the hate you give. Um, and, you know, the, the whole naming thing, right? That's such a big concept with Angie's universe and, you know, it just kind of sets it up perfectly. Yeah, it's a great ending. Like, I mean, I love the fact that they don't mention her name. That that dramatic tension of not not actually saying her name mm-hmm. leaves that open for the world of the hate you give, which is now Star's world. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me a lot of like something that Ben Sines would do with his own fiction. You know, the way he kind of sets up his his characters and you know with, with um where we don't need to get a scene right of that what happens after you know i think ben signs in that hemingway school just like i think angie does here at the end you know that doesn't need to be said right just like with with um ants right how she kind of narrated um his reds uh and steph right um so I like that, you know, I, I really like this, this writing style, you know, I think it makes it really readable and to the point. Yeah. It also, it also kind of reminded me of um, Poet X um, hmm. with the last line for Poet X, how she's talking about a poem being a lantern in mm, the dark. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't and, remember that. Some, yeah, go ahead. I was just thinking of like how, these characters are finding something to kind of pull them out of their, I guess, misfortunes or their sufferings mm. or the hardships, I guess, that they're facing. Um, so right. they, they find something that's able to help them get out of that mindset. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, um, it, it, it's a really kind of melancholic and sweet ending, you know, for for Mav and for Lisa and, you know, um, and it kind of, you know, makes me want to reread uh, The Hate You Give, right? Because it's been mm-hmm. a while. And uh, maybe watch the, the film adaptation too, even though they changed some things. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so, you know, this is, um, I hope you all um, get a chance to pick up a copy at your bookstore, your local bookstore, if you can. And um, um, hope you you all enjoyed our discussion of it. Um, this is uh, w- this was our book for Black History Month, as I, we had mentioned. Um, so we're going to be moving on to another book, uh, naturally for March. So um, stay tuned, and uh, hope you all keep uh, listening uh, and reading along with us. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Literally Literary, brought to you by Border Census and Power at the Pass. 
This episode, we discussed Concrete Rose by Angie Thomas. If you haven't read it, we hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. Follow us on Instagram at literallyliterary.ep and on Twitter at literallylitep.